Welcome to Closing the Loop, a podcast hosted by Lakeside Process Controls, where we connect you with experts, end users, and suppliers in the industrial automation industry. My name is Justin Kozak, business unit lead for Measurement Solutions and host of the show. Each episode will feature special guests from Lakeside Process Controls, Emerson Automation Solutions, and other industry leaders. We hope that through these conversations, we can close the loop between your current knowledge and the latest advancements in industry. Our goal is to educate you, provide you with ideas for improving efficiency and safety throughout your facility. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to today's guest, none other than Rich Ireland himself. Welcome to the show, Rich. Hey, Justin. Good seeing you. Excellent. Good to be up here in uh, nice sunny Canada today. <laughs> Not too sunny, though, compared to where you're yeah, from. Right. Exactly. Flying up from Florida for yeah, us today. Exactly. Well, really appreciate you coming. Yeah. Um, let's start off with just basic introductions. So give us a rundown of who you are, why you're here, what's your expertise, what's okay. your background? Yeah, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm the... Uh, Regional manager, area manager, however you want to call it, for the uh, Rosemount Tank Gauging Business Unit, which we're based in Houston, Texas. That's where our office is for North America. Um, we're a smaller uh, business unit, about 20, 20 people, 25 people with uh, three area managers and uh, work in the U.S. And, uh, and Eastern Canada for me and Western Canada for my counterpart on the West Coast. And um, <clears throat> we uh, handle and focus primarily on uh, large above ground storage tank applications for inventory management uh, in the fuel supply chain. And uh, I've been in the level industry for over 35 years. I know I uh, started out as a, as a manufacturer's rep. Oh, yeah. And I uh, sold several different process level type products over the years and then uh, became a rep for Saab yep. and uh, worked with them, built some good relationships within the company. I left the instrument industry for a little, just a couple of years and came back as in the RM role that I have now. And I've been with uh, that role for, I think, going on, I think it's 19 years. Wow. This, uh, <clears throat> this coming. So, you know what they don't tell you, though, when you're getting into the tank gauging and level world? It's how many stairs you're going to have to climb up. That should I've, have been a, a warning for somewhere. I, I'm not going to blame my bad knees on that, but uh, that probably combination of that and mountain biking and some other mm. stuff. And, uh, but uh, I, I have I had a couple of knee surgeries. Luckily, I hadn't had any replacements yet, so that's good. Oh, what a relief. And <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so that's my background. And, uh, you know, I, I, and I, I did a lot of work. I, I, I previously, worked in the in the service side of things even okay. before my rep company i worked for uh, an industrial drive systems business oh, really? uh, Reliance, reliance electric i did a lot did some plc work uh, for weighing systems so i have pretty broad yep. industrial experience but yeah and then when it comes to tank gauging it's a very specific need so it makes sense being on a smaller team with you know specialized it knowledge is. right it's, it's very focused it's a lot, a lot to do with um the regulations and operation, mm. the standards that go around uh, the tank industry, knowing that. And uh, honestly, what really is a strength in our in our particular business unit is the longevity of all of us and in the industry. Mm. We're, we're kind of a mix of subject matter experts along with salespeople. Yeah, that, and, It's a good combination. Yeah. And, and, you know, we'll talk about a little bit of what tanking is, but, but just in general, I know when it comes to radar or, or level measurements, yeah. It can be tough because unlike other instrumentation or valves where you can size and select and have confidence going to work, there's a bit of trust and experience that you're always going to have. I, I, you can't say for certain when the radar is going to work. You might be 90 percent confident, yes. even 95. But there's always an element yep. of uncertainty, and it's it's a it's a much larger mm-hmm. challenge uh, for for the process level salesperson to be honest with you mm. because of the dynamics of that that um, <clears throat> measurement. We're in the tank gauging world. We're you know. By definition, we're a static measurement yeah. of fuel, and static is definitely a favor for us when you're trying to measure something. So the fact that the uh, material is, I mean, in this large API 650 storage tank, which in essence is a giant metal lab beaker, you know, graduate beaker, because yeah. it's uh, it has those kind of metrics behind it. It actually has a strapping table that's very high resolution, and all that's put in the software with all the measurement. It looks like a clunky metal uh, tank, yeah. but you know, really, it's a measurement device. It's pretty sophisticated. Yeah, the whole tank is. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a step back here. Can, maybe you can walk us through a little bit of the history of tank gauging. You, you kind of hinted a little bit about it mm-hmm. when you mentioned Saab. Uh, you know, maybe take me back to what we were doing before it was called automatic tank gauging. Yeah. So in the industry, years and years ago, we we uh, uh, 
derived this measurement called barrels because that's mm. the average size of a wooden barrel. Yep. And they put oil in because the oil was coming out of the ground. They didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, then they started uh, putting it in these larger tanks. And then, uh, you know, typically they, they realized quickly that, you know, this stuff has a, a volume expansion factor associated mm. with it against uh, temperature. And uh, so you had to be careful how much you put in. So the watchful eye and Back in those days, I mean, you basically climbed the tank and you measured it with a, with a stick or a or a, <laughs> a plumb bob, and, and don't laugh because that's still the standard today for custody transfer in North America. So, <laughs> I, you know, there's a guy climbing up the tank and yep. uh, dropping a bob down and measuring the liquid contents, and so uh, that's where that started. And then, you know, it it started going into um, obvious gadgetry, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, for the lack of a better word, you know, where you'd take a side, what's called a sideboard gauge. They'd, they'd paint a, paint some marks on the side of the tank and drop a, a plumb bob or something that floated on one side and marking up and down so they oh, could yeah. see a representation on the outside of what's on the inside, right? And then, then it moved into uh, mechanical float and tape systems, which are still prevalent today on almost every tank. Um, then they electro they electronically connected those float and tape systems. So if you had that automated, <coughs> yeah. Excuse me. And then, um, uh, and then servo was a big, you know, nineteen fifties sixties technology where it was a little more, uh, aut- a little more electronic. And it, as it sounds, a closed loop system that instead of yeah. just float, just using physical floating, it, it actually searched for displacement. Mm. And, and did some of that kind of stuff. So that's and that technology is still in use today, and uh, and then radar came along from this little company in Sweden called Saab. Yeah, and uh, we basically took a uh, which was a missile altimeter because mm-hmm. um, it was a defense company primarily. If you know Saab Aerospace, and uh, basically figured out you could measure level with that because there was a there was some sort of a push towards. Um, tanker ships having to spray down when they left port hmm. and the mechanical gauging did not survive the spray down very well so they needed ah. a non-contact means of cleaning those out cleaning all that crude oil and whatnot out of those tanks so Saab became the standard quickly on the on the sea and then um in 1984 i believe it was the first land-based Saab was put in service because all these tankers would pull in with this fancy radar system on it and the guys on the land were climbing up. I want on. that, too. Yeah, I want that. How do I get that? That's so, interesting. So that was all developed over there in Gothenburg, Sweden, where the factory remains today. Yeah. And in 2001, I believe it was, uh, Emerson acquired Saab. the Saab. Yes. Okay. And uh, we became the Center for Excellence for Level in the organization, and the R&D and, and uh, uh, manufacturing is still primarily done in, in Gothenburg. And we have a brand-new factory that's about four years old now. Wow. And uh, it's a beautiful place. You ought to go over there and see it sometime. It's, it's, on, the, it's yeah. on the list. I'm waiting for the invite. So maybe oh, okay. Well, you're invited. Oh, know. okay. <laughs> well, okay. Well, what are you doing next week? <laughs> okay. All right. Good. <laughs> oh, wow. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah and and uh, I didn't know that about, um, I thought it was, they were using DP level possibly, and maybe they were having issues with density. I, w- I always thought, because I know radar and uh, DP le- electrical based DP level was was kind of around the seventies, ba- similar timing, I imagine. Yeah, you know that's a good point. You bring it up. The DP level took on a life of its own from the success of really good solid pressure measurement in the process industries. People understood pressure really well, um, and the chemical industry, I'd say, would be the primary user of DP level. Okay, because um, it, it's it's a it's a known quantity to them. A couple, yep. Throw a couple of a uh, throw a couple of them. Um, um, did I have my volume off? I'm sorry. Did I, no, you're right good. No, okay. Good. Um, yeah, the um, uh, throw a couple pressure transmitters in yeah. there and let it rock, right? So that was DP level, and it's still used a lot in the, yes. in the industry. Oh, yeah. And it does have every, every, place every, caveat, every caveat you mentioned, density oh. changes and drift and, and all that good stuff. And um, so, uh, again, that's a big uh, potential for radar. It really is. Um, and that's a process level radar, uh, really primarily yeah. target. Um, there's also, uh, other technologies that are there that, uh, um, like using pressure as bubbler systems was yep. another system that was out there. That, you still uh, see those today. In- I, I am surprised. There are a few <laughs> out there. I mean, there's actually one airport that I know that still uses it for primary measurement. Wow. Um, we're hoping to displace that someday. Yeah. But, you know, um, and then, uh, uh, you'd, you'd mentioned, uh, yeah, pressure, and then there was the other. You said you had, uh, 
It was something that had my mind going. Oh on. well, I was thinking a little bit about. So if we go back to yeah, nineteen seventies, radar is invented, uh, DP level. Um, can you help explain and help people understand when we say radar? What like what are we talking? What do those devices look like? How big are they? How complex are they? Because I think it's important to understand the magnitude of of what they used to be versus what they are yes, now. There's yes. huge improvements that have made. Quite a change. I mean, when you when you saw like the the first Saab land gauge, which called TRL Tank Radar Land, is mm-hmm. what it meant, and that was the name of the gauge. I wasn't around for the installation of those, but I saw a few of them out in existence in the wild, wow. you know, and uh, they, that was a huge product. Um, it, the, the pro- the main radar unit weighed something like 400 pounds Ooh. and it had to be put up on a crane to lift up on the top of the tank. And that was only part of the unit. And then there was a processing unit, Whoa. which was like a filing cabinet. I have seen those in the wild still. People just never took them out. They're just <laughs> they're sitting too in there. Heavy and big yeah, to they're big. And I've them. actually seen the gauges on top of tanks to this day. Just left there. They're just left so abandoned they, I, in place. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I've told people. I don't know if this is true. They're like the size of a refrigerator, right? Yeah, the whole thing yeah. together was pretty big. And then um, <laughs> uh, you, it was hard to miss. And then uh, the... They were very good, very reliable. We, ex- yeah. you know, we were going on something like thirty years, and we were just like clamoring to talk to customers about, please take these out because there's no parts. <laughs> nobody <laughs> can, yeah, nobody point. can support these things. So, um, but we we've done a really good job of displacing, you know, getting those out. Obviously, mm-hmm, customers mm-hmm. that needed to. But uh, and you know, the, the fundamental thing about the tank aging product line is it was based then on a frequency modulated continuous wave, which was. A big deal. We we started out with that day one, and we started out with a 10 gigahertz uh, number. And the reason 10 gigahertz wasn't because uh, the car industry made chips like 80 gigahertz is, for yes. instance. That's not why we did it. It was done based on an application um, of of the um, technology. It's like what's going to be best for these tanks. I mean, it was it's optimal. The, it, it was, was, it was the optimal wanted, frequency. It was. it was the optimal frequency through tests and trials. Mm. So I still contend today it's the best frequency to measure tank gauging. Okay. It has its trade-offs like everything in physics. The antennas tend to be a little larger, but that doesn't yes. seem to be a problem in these large these tanks. These massive tanks. Yes. Right. And, uh, and the stability is so good. And uh, we've used that from the beginning. Hence, in our fourth generation product, we can still retrofit to antennas for the most part, all the way back to the first ones. Wow! I've taken TRLs out of service and uh, put fifty nine hundreds right on top. And so, this is something which I think is pretty interesting. So, uh, most people are familiar with pulsed radar. That seems to be yes. pretty mm-hmm. pretty okay. So, for those who are not, essentially, it's a time of flight measurement. So, you shoot a microwave signal, you know how fast that travels. Like yep. you just time. How long did it take? until it hit the surface and came back. Okay, well, we know how long or how, how far it went. Divide by two because it's got to go there and back. That's the basics of time of flight. Um, but as I understand that, yeah, that came out after FMCW. And now for our process level measurements, we've, we've gone back to FMCW. So yes. this is kind of this intermediary technology. Where did this come from? Why, why did we have to go pulse? Why couldn't we just go FMCW on process level measurements from the 1970s? I don't know if I can answer that question. I can tell you why we picked FMCW at the time. Okay. Um, you know, when you look at trying to measure finite uh, time uh, intervals yes. like that, the electronics, I mean, we're talking speed of light here, mm. not speed of sound like ultrason- or like ultrasonics. Yep. Um, we're talking 186,000 miles per second versus 336 <laughs> meters per second. Anyway, um, you know, so you got all this and... Uh, you're you're trying to make electronics resolve that mm. you'd never ca- it's, I mean, imagine being the slow guy at the stopwatch operator at the fifty <laughs> yard dash. I mean, yeah. you can't do it. You'd yeah. never get it right. So it was easier to take uh, and measure. You can measure phase differences, frequency differences, much easier than you could um, even with older electronics. You can see phase mm. difference, and that's what we're doing. We're really we're really measuring the difference between two signals in frequency. Yeah, and that happens to have a a beta effect of how accurate we can be on on our um you know yeah yeah our accuracy that, there that so makes sense. why they went to that with ultra with pulse probably just because of a simpler yeah the ability to do it and cheaper um and, and the FCW technology mm-hmm. for a while also was pretty power hungry right? yeah it, that's it was, the other thing that's that a very I, good point big yeah. big point there we you know we were four wire radars in all cases I yeah. think because of the processing that had to go with it makes sense. And, you know, I think that old, if I'm not mistaken, I may be speaking out of turn, but I think that that was those, those pulse radar concepts were, 
public domain from mm. Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, mm. I believe, much like you know Polaroid ultrasonic technology it was gotcha. like pretty open available on the market. So you had a lot of people jumping in on it. Oh, uh, okay. And pretty simple to put together. Right? Yes. Yeah. 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 You didn't have to sweep a frequency. You just had to take a gun yeah, diode just, and, you know, pop out a frequency. So. And away you go. Yep. Okay. So, okay, so we talked a little bit about radar. Well, let's take a step back, actually, and look at, you know, what is a tank gauging solution and this active tank gauging? What, what are we trying to do here? What's the goal? It's not just about level measurement. That's that's too simple, right? Yep, it, exactly. It, tank gauging is a, is a static quantity measurement for, for volume. And... Uh, we were saying that you know, people sell in mass, I guess, and buy in volume is one of the uh, adages, I guess. And uh, I see that. I mean, you know, a lot of the chemical plants will sell stuff in mass, but then somehow it turns into volume when they're when companies like, are, well, especially fuel, it's it's sold in barrels and it's sold yeah. in barrels at a specific frequency. Yeah, I mean frequency temperature. It's sold at barrels at a specific temperature, and it's um, uh, sixty degrees Fahrenheit in the U.S. and 15 degrees C in Canada and Europe and everywhere else. And uh, they're roughly the same. And that, that just normalizes the volume around yes. the world. So just because you have an X barrel, you know, X 100,000 barrel tank, that doesn't mean that's, you know, you know it's going to have different. When you observe the liquid in that tank at a certain temperature, that liquid will be different at a different temperature because of correction. And you're selling it at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Whatever it is, whatever it would be at 60 degrees, that's how much you have. Yeah, yeah. That, and, and it's really, it's, it's, it's accounting. It's inventory. It is. Right? It, it's, it's, just you know, to normalize everything and make sure everybody's on the same page and it's custody transfer. Um, you know, we, we, there's a whole procedure. And uh, we mentioned, uh, we just had a little training here at Lakeside with some new folks. And I was just talking about American Petroleum Institute, the API, which yeah. is, a you know, an American company, our American uh, organization uh, started in America, oh gosh, over 100 years ago. Mm. Um, but it's, uh, it's the worldwide, seems to be the worldwide standard for, for fuel and how to build yes. a tank and er- everything about moving product and building tanks and pipelines and whatnot. And uh, it's an industry standard, industry group, working group that constantly looks for updates to standards and there's a mix of the regulators on these committees and vendors like ourselves, manufacturers like ourselves, experts. And, uh, and we all, everybody has input to a uh, subject of interest that yes. so they're, they're stakeholders somehow in that, 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 that reason. And they're on, they're on the re- committee for a reason. Right. And, um, you know, we do everything from overfill prevention standards, uh, how to measure um, the proper way to do a radar measurement on a tank. That's API chapter three, for instance. You know, yep. It's a whole measurement. Uh, the, that chapter three covers measurement, hand measurement, everything measurement. Wow. So, and then calculations. So <clears throat> so the API um, uh, also has a very interesting history of, you know, they did a very good job at documenting the volume correction factors of standard products in, mm. in the fuel industry. So that's pretty cool. they kind of own the volume correction tables, if you will. So everybody that's doing things and correcting to those standards will have an API lookup table, either electronically or manually, if you're that far oh, behind. Wow. Yeah. So it, um, it, it's kind of like um, uh, when we talk DP flow meters, there's ISO standards for different primary elements like orifice plates. And it's yes. the standard to for the correct corrections and, and compensation factors and, and, that's really what, right. what they're all about. Sure. Um, um, let's take a, a, a step to talk about the tanks that you actually would be looking at here, because I think that's important to also understand. We're not talking um, necessarily very small tanks, right? These are these are these look a certain way. They feel a certain way generally. Yep. What, what would that be? Most people, uh, you, you know, you can't hide these tanks very well. If you look on Google <laughs> Earth, they're, they're pretty easy to find. They're very large. Um, I, I take anybody that's interested, if you want to see, like, the, a huge installation of tanks, just to spin your Google Earth and go look at Cushing, Oklahoma, for instance, which mm. is like a thousand tanks or something in one Whoa. in one area. So it's the largest tank uh, intersection in the world. So wow. it's a uh, huge. And uh and uh it's good to know that we have about ninety percent of those tanks have uh, uh, Emerson gauges on them, so that's pretty good. And um but uh, look at that. So you're talking about tanks that are anywhere from eighty to 180 feet in diameter and wow. fifty feet tall, typically forty eights the reference height and uh they're all built to the api 650 standard Mm -hmm. so you know the same kind of plating based on the size everything's the same they go through the same inspection procedures which is every 10 years or so um take the tank out of service do everything inspect it but but i'm happy you mentioned the diameter because that's super important because 
you know, everybody thinks about accuracy just in terms of the level, but what you're not realizing is if, if you're an inch off, right, that could, that could be a significant yeah. amount of money that we're talking here. Right. Or you might think you have more inventory or less inventory, and that has huge implications. Yeah, exactly. I mean, think about it. I mean, if you had a, a little bucket of water in inches, you know, you can spill it on the ground. Yeah, it makes a little bit of mess. But imagine if you had a big tub of water and an inch of that came out, right? It's a lot more water. And uh, that's the whole point of trying to do everything you can from the beginning. It's a process of keeping accuracy. It's like, well, you guys are kind of overkill at half a millimeter in your gauge, right? I'm like, well, not really, because everything subtracts from there. Exactly. You start in the effect of installation. Uh, this happens, that happens. And you're trying to wind up at the end of the day with something that resembles about six, uh, sixteenth of an inch. Mm. Wow. You know, that's acceptable. Gotcha. And, and in North America, in some places it's not. Some places it's uh, three millimeters or really with effects of installation. It's pretty, you know. Wow. Yeah. So you have to do everything. Now, when you're doing that, there's a lot of other you know, things you have to do, like bracing of the steel pipes and mm. certain designs are a lot closer. And yeah. So level is the first variable, right? Yes. And it's the, it's, let me say this before we even get to level. The first thing is strapping of the tank, hmm. having the, the graduated beaker, so to speak. Who puts the lines on the graduated beaker, right? The, you got to, they take, you you tip, typically you come in with a laser system these days and they go and they do a laser survey of the inside of the tank hmm. and they get all the internal volumes and distances and calculate some volumes and they might take some sort of a decent resolution up and down the tank and then they interpolate. Now, they do a real real fine analysis of places that have uh, variations, sumps and pipes and things that are going to affect that volume. So they do some real real high-resolution calculations, and then the rest of them are just interpolated. They're just mm. straight up and down until the tangent. They're just straight up, right? Yeah, that makes sense. And then that that's very important. That's your calibration. That's the tank calibration. That's the first step, right? And then you put this thing in service, and then you got this radar gauge, and you've got to coordinate that level measurement to that to that, uh, to those numbers. And yeah. you, know, you always want a customer when you're going in with a new commissioning. It's like you have the strapping, the latest strapping table mm. information. Some people call them a tank capacity table. Sorry, and they have to update that how often? Every, they do that usually every time they take it out for an API 653, which okay. is, could be 5 to 10, depending on the, their schedules. Interesting. So they will update it, I guess, as maybe the tank might change in shape a little bit? Yeah, because they might even go in and put new plate in because of uh. some of the things they're doing with the tear. They might be installing some new... Um, you know, pipes, or they might change the bottom because of something. So they have to update that on a regular wow. basis. And there, there, I know there's been a push to uh, make that more frequent, but uh, mm. I haven't really heard. I'm not on those. I don't sit yeah. on the API 650 committee. But do you know? Do you know if that changes? Like from experience, from every five years, like if you look at those strapping tables, are there significant differences? You know, it's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Huh. But uh, it would be interesting to see. I, yeah, I, I could curious. probably get that answer for you. It's pretty easy. I got a few people that know that information, but. <laughs> Uh, by heart, because that's all they do for a living, right? But uh, it, it's amazing. But, uh, yeah, this, that's the start. And then you put the tank, you know, then you get the radar gauge installed, the, the tank gauge. And I like to d- make sure you understand there could be a difference because uh, yes, there's certain specific kind of connections on a big tank that we know are there. And we build our antennas to easily fit. And the radars them. for that. And I, li- I like to say, too, there's – there's a reason it's called um, uh, like a tank gauging measurement or right. um, yeah, versus a level transmitter, right? Like th- those to me are different things yes. because the act of tank gauging versus a level measurement are different things, right? Tank gauging is all about inventory and accounting. Level transmitter is all about, well, how much do I got three quarter full, mm-hmm. a half full? Am I going to overfill it? Yes, right? yes. Yeah, and, and, and true. I mean, there is a level LT function to a tank gauge, but yep. that's not its only function. No way. And uh, and then there's also in, in, co- in coordination with that uh, accurate, you know, first thing highly accurate level, right? And then there's uh, in an, another measurement called ullage, and that's exa- ex- actually the the ullage means the empty space in the tank, and it's actually what we measure. We really don't measure level; we measure ullage, okay? Because we only measure distance down to the product. We have to infer by the calculations in the strapping table how much level that correlates to based on the ullage yes and, and i think for us canadians we might say it eulage but yes. i also might be saying it wrong too <laughs> I, i've heard it both ways justin i don't think you're wrong I, i've heard it all different kind of ways and uh it's okay to say it that way okay but yeah so ullage and and um i mean i'm listening to swedes say it and yes stuff. That, they, so they, you're impacted by yeah, that so too. listen to that so um you know 
so that's how we do it. And then we have um, uh, uh, usually a string of temperatures. Mm-hmm. Now, why a string? Well, yeah. the product does have, you know, stratification of temperature, and you're trying to get an average product temperature. That's, mm. you know, to a specification. That's an API Chapter 7 specification. And uh, you're know, supposed to be placed so at such a distance. We always exceed that by a lot, usually. Put in a lot more RTD points than are needed. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you there's some positional you know dynamics like not too close to the wall 36 inches away from the shell 36 inches up from the bottom you know there's a lot of little stipulations where to put that yes yep. and where it's valid and so you don't have effects of ambient effects interesting outside. yeah okay and then the best you can and that's you know those are empirical they, they've been put by calculation and also application they, people have gathered that information and it's figured pretty, out what's... pretty pretty solid right yep. and um so you put that in and you correlate the level with the temperature in, in the in the electronic magic mm. box and then you basically calculate the product uh, the, the wet the wet RTDs the ones that are under liquid are, are the only ones examined and used in the calculation. Oh, so it, it knows to ignore the dry ones. Yes. Wow. Yes, and some people some people can still they can still see the values because yeah. they might be interested in their very top vapor yeah. temperature. But so does it, does it know just by the temperature or seeing the differences between? Is no, it, it's it's it just correlates. You you have to go in and register in the tank hub the exact placement of the of the. Oh, so based on the low. radar, it knows which ones to turn off or turn on. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, wow. and you know, and the, and we they they become. First of all, they're they're independent these days, and you know we we set set up four wire independent RTDs for each point you know, yes. at this point. Um, and you know every now and then, it's not like it, you know it's gotten more reliable over the years. You might have a point that goes out for some reason. Mm, it's like Christmas light. Yeah, boom. But you <laughs> you can go in there and just check that out and say don't e- ignore this one. It's bad. Okay, you know, so we usually unlike, have sixteen of these in there, so it's not a big deal. I was gonna say unlike the Christmas lights, yeah. the one bulb goes out. That's it. You gotta yeah, get it all you're done. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So we don't have that issue, but. Good. Uh, so you can do that, and then there's also the option of having what's called a water bottom sensor, yes. which is um, a little uh, admittance type device at the bottom that's calibrated for the the kind of water you're going to see in a crude tank, and it'll give you a crude or oil, you know, whatever kind of tank. Usually measures about 18 inches max. So water gets in these tanks <clears> just through means. transportation pipeline. Just sometimes it gets in, and then obviously all the oil floats on top of the water. Mm-hmm. So if yep. you want to have the truest of accuracy, you got to make sure right. that it's well. We're taking yep. out. A, okay, that makes sense. You got gross standard volume, and then you got net standard volume. And the gross standard volume is it was all that junk in there, and the, mm. the water and sand, and corrected to a yes sixty degrees. But then you have to say, well, let me take the sand and the uh, the water, water out of there. The, and, and that is something that's attached to the temperature sensor, yes. right? That's that's beneath it. Yeah, and it's okay. an option. You don't have to have it. But okay. Yeah. And some customers, what they do, it's it, it. They may just go up there periodically and take a, a sample, a sample, oh. and just net that into the into their how, how do they do that? They have There's a, a bottle that has a bottom thief that they call it a thief. And okay, it just it basically takes a cut. They call it a water cut. So it's huh. like a tube. Yep. That just slides through. Imagine the water's going in. Yep. The oil's going in and out the top, in the bottom, out the top. And the, they hit the bottom, and then they close both lids, and they got a captured slice of it's like a core sample oh. of the product. Oh, so it's kind of like like taking yeah. a straw, yes. you know, putting the straw and put your thumb on it, and then yep. pulling it out. Exactly. And then Except examining they, it. They, they, they kind of, you know, have a gadget that closes the bottom and yeah. the top. But, yeah. A little more fancy than my yeah. straw. But, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Analogy straw applies. Yes. Huh. So that's how that works. But so that's, that's optional. Yeah, and that's an option. And okay. some, you know, some pretty serious customers buy that. Some yes. don't. Um, and again, in North America, we we don't have the uh, the legal uh, requirement for custody transfer with automatic leveling, automatic mm. gauging systems. Um, it's done strictly today, still by the tape method, the man on the top of wow. the roof method. Believe me, there's a lot of people working <laughs> to try to get that change, including me, because yeah. I sell tank gauges for a living. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, it, so it's it's a challenge there to, to get them to swing for that. But a lot of a lot of companies are on their own, um, you know, looking themselves in the mirror, going, "Yeah, we need to do this better. Yeah, yeah. You know, we got to do this better." Yeah. You know, so they, that's what we see, and we see, and it's global. You know, a lot of global companies. That's their global practice. I mean. We have companies here in Canada that are glo- very large global storage companies that yeah. write their they don't write their standards for uh, operation standards for just 
here and yes, everywhere it's a global, else. Yeah. yeah, so they yeah. probably have more experience globally in some of these instances. Yes. Okay. And uh, so that's that's kind of a you know, trend you see, and as as companies are more global, mm-hmm. um, which is good. And then um, uh, all that gets culminated into an electronic signal. Yes, you know? there could be a, a density, density measurement. Yep, okay. that's, that's done. That's done with. And boy, you know who who better to do a density measurement than with a Rosemont thirty one thirty fifty one S, right? Yeah, I mean best the best gauge in the world, the best pressure gauge in the world as a density. And that, and that, and that, yeah, so that's done from pressure to give you hydrostatic the, yeah. hydro. I'm curious why they would not use uh, like a densitometer, like a micro motion densitometer. You could, yeah. but it's probably overkill in a uh, sense. And uh, there are companies out there that do other kinds of densitometers. And, interesting. But we like our good old 3051S. Yeah, I'm not complaining. With the G, the gauge mount. Yeah. yeah. It works pretty but good. But that's also optional as well. That's, it is. That's not it a, is. And, you know, it's, it's an extra step yes. you can go. Okay. Yes. And then you'll find several customers that are refinery customers, for instance, are they're more about their operational awareness and kind of knowing where their level is. They're not mm. doing inventory at that point until it gets to their, until it gets to the logistics side of their operation. They literally call it the logistics side of the operation, oh, which really? is where they start counting the stuff, right? Yes. Now they they do they'll do level and they might do a single point temperature measurement just at the bottom, thirty six inches oh. up, and it's going to render a certain amount of volumetric correction but not enough yes. for for custody yes but we see a lot of that too interesting and, uh, yes. so then in the different tanks throughout the facility it's not the same it's not just a standard for all it depends on what tank is being used for where it is in the process in a refinery i'd say that's the case or or it just depends on the philosophy of the operating company and how they feel um, about it like we have a lot of terminals that finish terminals that hmm. that's what they do they just do the single point and uh, they're probably relying more on their hand gauge regimen and their multi- they do temperature measurement at that oh. time that's probably what they're actually doing and they just need something to kind of back it up and to, verify it yeah to bit. give them the check box yeah that, so that they're doing it's that kind of like that interesting and, and then uh, you know over the years um one of the you know we, we we sat down this is probably 15 years ago like what are the three drivers of this thing in north america it's like well inventory accuracy mm-hmm. of course you know back yeah. when a lot of these companies were having especially with Sarbanes-Oxley, which was a U.S. law that came in holding companies responsible, the higher of the higher ups of the companies for the legitimacy. They couldn't just blame it on the accounting firm kind of thing. Really? That came from an Enron, the Enron oh. problem, right? So they want to know. They want to, they want to protect themselves, cross their T's, dot their I's, be aware. And then the other one was uh, uh, overfill prevention, right, environmental safety. Yeah. And then the other one was... Uh, was safety itself, human safety, because the less people you have going up on tanks, the safer the operation is, right? I mean, you up point. here in Canada, how many times uh, does it snow? Oh, a few times. <laughs> and, you know, those those stairs don't clean themselves, right? Oh, and, no. I, I It's funny because I do remember a specific instance of um, a mine site that we were working with way, way, way up north, and they had, they had one or two of these big, big um, – mm-hmm. uh, terminal tanks because you know when you're that far up north um you have to store your own diesel or, or different kind of fuels that you have for, for right. actually i'm pretty sure it was a, a site where you in the winter time you could only get there via the ice roads so anyways it was uh we wanted to confirm what they had on uh this tank and uh i guess just because of the, the weather conditions and it was so bad they, they were struggling to be able to get up this tank to be able to get us these details and and because of you know the weather conditions are so bad too that the stairs were half broken it wasn't <laughs> safe so you know the manager was one who had to go he didn't want to put his, his personnel at risk um and it was it was tough just just to get him up there to then get that information right yes and it's it's uh you know there's certain times and you know we, we're all we're all about safety at emerson yeah right and uh, we can we can call off a job whenever we need it. Sometimes it's to the chagrin of our, our client who wants us to do something that we don't feel like we're going to do. Yep. And I've been in situations like that where I've been like wind and, and snow. And I'm oh, like, yeah. I'm not climbing up those stairs. No. And uh, I'm not going up on top of that tank with 50 mile an hour gust wind. Sorry, there's no rail. You know, I'm like, no, it ain't going to happen. Oh, yeah. So, you know, that you have to be able to call off those jobs. And, um, you know, so... Uh, that's a safety issue. I've seen it per- firsthand, at, even in my role, right? Imagine if you're doing that every day and you're sending somebody up there. That, I mean, the fuel still flows in the wintertime, right? And you got to go do these. If they're relying on those gauge measurements, they're putting people the potential harm. And in the upstream markets, for instance, where they're getting a lot of these volatile, like Bakken crudes, mm. and beauty, those have a lot of light products and yeah. they have a lot of, a lot of a VOC. And uh, they're getting this, they have starting to have some issues with with safety up yeah. on this tank. So, man, 
you know, the more automation you need to keep your people safe, keep them off the tanks. And I trust me. And when I say this, you're not going to get a more repeatable, accurate measurement from a guy with a freezing cold, <laughs> you know, trying to get up there than our our, oh, our tank gauge. And, and in fact, in any case, we always have the most accurate measurement if it's put in right. I mean, just you don't have to worry about it. It's going to work and it's going to be right. You don't have to recalibrate it. Um, well, know. I just I think about just even filling up my gas tank in the winter, right? Yeah, like, I, mean, I don't know if I get every little drop in there in the winter. Yeah, it's like exactly. The wind's blowing. Oh, I might have missed a drop. Exactly. You know, same same premise applies. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's the that's the key. You know, we, we those are the three drivers. Overfill is yeah. huge. Uh, I can yes. touch on that a little bit. Um, you know, we there's you know the more penetrations and the more openings in your tank, then you know the more maintenance and more cost and everything. So if you can do a lot of things at once in in a tank, uh, one one opening, we came out with the fifty nine hundred system. Uh, it's been a while now. We've had it out, but we patented the two in one technology, which is a very unique thing in our industry. It's uh it's two independent radars housed in the same uh fifty nine hundred S top box, if you will. They're they're completely electrically independent. They do not interfere with each other. You don't have to go into if you're a physicist out there. Don't go into a meltdown. It's it it, it works. Trust us. Um, they work independently of each other in that t- same tank. So uh, we have a lot of customers, and it's it's even more so these days that are deploying it because the cost of admission to get an extra complete radar gauge layer is not all that much, to be honest with you. And uh, it's about the same price as installing a mechanical level switch. Hmm. We've done the numbers. We've gone through it. And you'll be able to put that in and uh, and have the assurance of a very, very high reliability uh, gauge uh, that's looking at your overfill. And So this is so it's it's two radars, the same antenna, and, and that's correct, right? Yes. Yeah, and it's people always kind of question when they go, what, what happens if, if the antenna fails. Sure. Um, so the antenna could fail, all yeah. right? But it's probably le- more likely that based on the MTBF numbers that we have of antennas, which are nothing but a, a, a piece of metal that's shaped in a certain way, yep. um, you might have a tank failure before you have an antenna failure, okay? And, and that's mean time before a failure. Yes, MTBF yeah. is 45,000 years, the last time I checked, <laughs> on, an, on a parabolic antenna. Yeah, which and, and tanks could be much less than that yes, exactly because so they actually have the fluid in them and they yes, they, yes yeah, so so people always that's one question that comes up a lot is is well what yep. about the antenna fails and, and it can happen like you said but yeah you probably are going to lose the electronics before you lose right. a hunk of metal right and it, and and it's uh there's a lot of uh you know I'll bring up another objection and we shouldn't be bringing up objections <laughs> on our own but we do but you know the objection is uh, well it's the same technology. You know, it's going to be a differentiation. Is oh. important. And that's the oldest argument in the statistical playbook that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, if you can have two of the most reliable things versus one of the most reliable and one of the not so reliable, I think two of the most reliable wins. Well, well, I, I'll tell you what. I've been through a situation where yeah. uh, the customer was – it wasn't it wasn't in a tank farm. It was just in a regular process tank uh, where they – because of a critical application, they wanted to have two different technologies. So they had a radar and they had a DP level measurement. And they're always going to have differences between them. Yes. And now the operators don't know which one to believe. They go, well, I kind of yep. believe this one today. I kind of believe that one today. And one of them is impacted by this and one of them is impacted by exactly. that. Exactly. And, and it was it, it created such a headache. I mean, even if they had two radars in there, uh, it probably would also so <clears throat> excuse me show different things too, causing confusion. So yes. uh, it was it was not a good situation. And and it's uh, no, it's, uh, it's it, I agree with you. Yeah, it yeah. might not always be the best solution. It might you might think of it and go, you know, you're designing it. You think, wow, that's great. Have a backup redundancy. Yeah. This is an impact by that. But then operators don't trust anything in that the, system. They're both they both have different systematic uh, influences that, yeah. that affect them differently at different points. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's what you don't realize. But so we, we, we do that with our two in one system. Um, mm. It's a, it's an excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, there's a lot of good, good features, a lot of value to um, uh, remote proof testing, which is something that can be done from the control room now, instead of going out and pulling on a proofing cable or whatever. Um, you can do that with very high confidence, you know, our, our system's designed around uh, we, when it was built. I mean, it was built from the ground up to be a SIL-rated system. Mm. Okay, so we went, we followed through the IEC 61508 procedures, and everything was d- done to that uh, end goal. Yeah. So whether you buy one that's SIL-labeled or not, it's still the same mm. everything, okay? And um, 
the MTBF follows along. I can look at the MTBF numbers for the SIL rated unit, and, you know, it's the same as the regular unit. Gotcha. And, um, and of course, MTBF and SIL are, are often mistaken as something similar. You can have something darn darn uh, reliable that fails unsafely, or you can have something that uh, mm. is really not so reliable that fails safely every time, and that's where your SIL comes in. So Interesting. Yeah, and um, so we... You know, we have that out there. We do a lot of those. So if you're interested in talking about that, you can always retrofit to that as well, which is a nice thing. It's a nice upgrade. Yes. And then we have customers that buy two-in-one simply for hot redundancy. They just want to be able to go up and move some wires and be done and <laughs> just keep on going. Yeah, that, That's pretty fair. Too. Actually, you can have them both wired to the same tank hub and just, yeah. just keep on rolling. You got one that's saying it's not working and the other one that is. So, But anyway. And, and also, yeah, I think you touched upon this a little bit was – you know, you want to minimize how many how many holes you put in the top of that yes. tank there. And another piece that I've also realized, too, is when you get up those stairs, um, you don't really want to go on the roof of the tank if you don't have to. If you can stay at the edge, that's yep. great. And so you kind of you kind of limits how, how many things you can have sure. there. You can't have seven different yeah. nozzles. It doesn't really make it easy. Yeah, some, some people call it like the perch area. Yeah, the, the perch. perch. Yeah, and... Uh, yeah, and it's it, they don't want to make the perch the whole tank. You know, they just they rather have all the stuff right there where you can work on. This is where the PRV vent is, and this is here, and that's there, and this is you know yeah. it's all right there. If you have to crane something up, it's easier than in the exactly. middle. Exactly. Right. And actually, that kind of um, a question I get a lot on the process level side is about can you mount two radars side by side? Does that impact things? Right. How does that impact for the two in one radar specifically? Yeah. It, it's it's no impact, um, and it's the same as two separate radars. There's yeah. no impact. The there's a white paper uh, that we have uh, that it, it's not it, it's not titled that it's titled yes. that using two radars in a two in one system. Okay. But in there, it explains those uh, potential collision incidents of two signals, and yes. they do a com- uh, they can wear you out with statistics. But yeah. it's like uh, you know, it does so many measurements that there might be one incidence in a three day period, and then it just ignores it. It mm. doesn't. Even, it's it's just built into the. It doesn't have any effect. A lot smarter people have yes. looked into that. The yeah. answer is no. Yeah, yeah the answer is <laughs> you no. You can it leave it at affect. that or you can read it if you want. Yeah, yeah I, that's kind of where I get to. Yeah, so the more important of that white paper is the fact that it's it, it's explaining independence, you know, and, it, and, yeah. and it's assuring you that it's independent, and and that's the key. You know? Yeah. And, um, so. So, so, okay, so I think we have a good idea now of the system in place. Maybe let's talk a little bit about uh, the system architecture, right? Because you mentioned a little bit yep. about Tank Hub. There's something called a system hub. Yep. I think all of this talks field bus. That's scary. I don't have field bus. How, exactly. does, how does that all work? Exactly. So the first thing I want you to do is uh, is, is listen to me. No, we're going to be put you in a hypnotic state. <laughs> Forget the word field bus. <laughs> it's tank bus. <laughs> so we we uh, we do use foundation field bus chips and the communication standards to communicate inter inter instrument. Yes, okay? we don't really use it. It's almost like an internal use for us. We all the all the tank mounted instruments are of the foundation field bus variety, intrinsically safe. Yes. And the tank hub, which is the 2410 box at the bottom, is Mm -hmm. kind of a segment manager for that tank dedicated to the function of tank gauging. And it's it's basically providing the intrinsically safe bus power to everything on the tank. It's gathering it. It's bringing it in. And all the commissioning technician has to do is assign those numbers to the tank 101 and give it an address for the rest of the system. And it just works. And yet, remember, you have to put the little values in you got to put your reference heights you got to put your temperature points in there and all that stuff this is very easy to configure and uh and that's it and then and then and then the sister hub which i call the tank hub of the tank hubs yes we listen uh this will go back and listen to me sweden we tried (laughs) to tell you to call it an fcu like the old one but they didn't they (laughs) named it the system hub and they insisted that it stay that way what does the fcu stand for field communication unit Gotcha. Okay. It just, it was different. They didn't have the word hub in it. And that's the best part, right? It's not another hub. Um, (laughs) So, I mean, it's almost like a who's on first, what, you know, that old routine. I feel like that sometimes in meetings with customers. Now, which hub are we talking about again? Is it the system? (laughs) The system hub or the tank hub? Yes. So the system hub is is the master uh, communication manager to a multi-hub installation. Mm -hmm. So typically the ideal large tank installation is one tank hub per tank. That's why it's called a tank hub, not a yep. tank hub. Okay. So one tank hub per tank. And we consider that one tank, you know, in the world, because we know there's multiple variable measurements, but it's one tank coming in. The system hub can support up to 64 tanks. Wow. 
Okay. And that means 64 hubs, if you will. Yeah. And um, so you can bring those in, or 64 levels is probably the better. It's levels and associated, all of the associated variables. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's a, it's a logical um, limitation of 64. Okay, inside the software. And then what that does is it's it's kind of a master to those hubs. So it, it's on its own continuous basis, updating, going out, reading all those tank hubs continuously, taking that measurement, taking those measurements and putting them in a proper buffer called a slave database. And there's multiple in this unit. And then those slave databases are there, and there's what's called host ports, group buses, whatever you want to call them, host mm-hmm. ports that go could be connected to tank master software for instance or a dcs system for the customer or a plc system for the customer and they have complete modbus capability to go in and grab all that information mm-hmm. without pulling every tank and waiting for a response oh. and pulling again and waiting for a response so it's very easy it also has a beautiful feature because it can tunnel to any one gauge without disturbing the rest of them so oh. there's a, another port that can sit there with the maintenance guy having his own version of the wind setup software, which is our communica- configuration tool software. Yep. And he's over in the shop eating a donut, drinking some coffee, <laughs> and he's going into the tank 102 to see what's going on with that rascal, and he sees that the guy left the hatch open or something like that. You know, he does a tank scan. But he can do that without disturbing anything else. In the in the system. Oh, that's pretty handy. Yeah. So that's one of the main main reasons to have a system hub. It's worth the price of admission, and um and uh, it also has some cool capabilities. If you're uh, building a new system and you uh are you have your own HMIs and you're not too worried about Tank Master, for instance, we have the ability now to do the full API calculation suites right in the system hub at the hardware level. Oh wow. So that's very good. So, so you just get right out what, exactly what right, you need. All your, yeah, all your, everything that's in Tank Master that does all those API calculations can be done in the system hub for every tank that's in there and in, in a ridiculously high number of 5,000 points of strapping per tank, which I can't believe that anybody would enter 5,000 <laughs> points. But, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of work to do that, yeah, I imagine. So. So, so you mentioned it. Okay, so then that's the next logical step is then what does the system hub then go to or what, what can, how can we view all these tanks? And I think you mentioned it. Tank Master. Yeah, so, so Tank Master is our inventory software, and it's, it's our HMI, if you will. And I try to stress that. It's not a control platform. So mm. if you, we have other platforms for that. For control. For control. This is for that, would be, that would be like something like a Delta V PK yes. or something like that. Where Tank Master works in consort with it, and mm. just uh, you know, it's another layer. Really, yes, it's a way right. to view it. Right, right. Because Tank Master is a PC based architecture, so I don't okay. know if I'd want that running my valves and yes. and all that good stuff. But it's a very reliable uh, inventory calculator and uh, operator interface to show what's in the tanks, the volumes in the tanks, um, uh, alarms, it, and it, it's got pretty good layering of. Uh, protection for password protection for every function like and uh, there's different all the different sign-ins is it's got good administrative features so okay. you can track which operator you know if homer simpson pressed the certain <laughs> wrong button you know it you know he was there okay can, can you change configurations uh of, oh of no uh, you, only the only in win setup and there's password uh. protection on that so you can't even change set points unless you're a certain level gotcha. you, but that's up to the that's up to the up to the site yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you have layers of you can, I mean, seriously, if you did have Homer on third shift, you could <laughs> l- lock him down so he, he can, can. Do, he can barely, you know, that's he can funny. check ESPN sports. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's all. So that's cool. Yeah. So, so, okay. So putting it all together, kind yeah. of, we have this tank master, uh, which is kind of the overarching software. I liked how you said that it works in concert to say like a PK controller or something. I, I like that way. We have system hubs, maybe, maybe not every application is a system hub, right. uh, tank hubs, maybe the next layer down and then we also have a combination of uh, temperature measurements radar level measurements maybe water water bottom measurements maybe density measurements that is in essence i mean that's in essence the components of tank gauge and that's just not tank gauge not that simple that's right but Mm -hmm. that's it so where can it go wrong (laughs) well i mean you first of all you have to you know you have to lay out the system um, you have to decide whether you want to be a wired or a wireless system. That's mm. another important uh, feature. Interesting. Um, because, you know, if we go into an old brownfield that has already beat up, you know, wire that's seen the war, you know, 
Mm-hmm. And you're going to try to, we can work on pretty nasty wire, but do you want to? Yeah, why? Why? Or do you want to run new wire? Yes. Right? That's pretty expensive. Right. Exactly. And, I, and I'd say that in most cases, if it's, a, if it's a greenfield site, we would probably really talk to them about wireless options. Um, wireless is, just keeps getting better and cable yes. just keeps getting older, right? I mean, that's the fact. And, uh, and we, we have a very good solution. We were probably the first. This is kind of bragging a little bit. But we, were the, <laughs> we were the first uh, business unit to integrate uh, into our into our Tank Master tool. It had direct wireless oh, really? configuration and everything. We configure right through our. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And, it, and it's, I think, at this point, I don't know if it's the 13th year or the 14th year of wireless yes. for Emerson. And I believe it's over 500,000 installations. It's, so it's, it's amazing. Not, it's not new. It's, it's not gotten new. better and better. Yep. Our knowledge, the most important thing is our knowledge has gotten better yeah. and better of ap- applying it, right? So we've learned. We have, I mean, man, you can't, you can stack the lessons learned. And I, I'm not even one of the digital transformation guys. That, yeah. that they live and breathe this stuff, yep. right? So if I'm ever in doubt, I have them look at the shot. Let's send them a Google Earth shot or something and they, get some second opinions on things. And uh, we can usually work out of any box. We can get something to work. I mean, it usually works really well. And uh, even with our, we, we were a little, I mean, honestly, we were, we, we, we used the 775 Thumb, which is a, our transceiver yes. for our, and we were a little skeptical of the range at first, but we haven't had, we, we just, we haven't, haven't had, had the problems. issues. No, we, we were dreaming them up before we had them. Right? <laughs> and then we never had them. So. so you would say probably problems can go wrong, maybe in the system design, as you're building it, as you're scaling right. it, but really once they're set up. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Not too much, right? Yes, you're right. I think the most important consideration on, say, retrofits, for instance. Um, retrofits can be, you know, can you can always put these in installed. They're all, we, most mm. of our tanks are installed in service, to be honest with you. Uh, but uh, uh, it's good to, we, you know, it depends on how they're mechanically installed properly. You know, goods, you know, we had one instance where a customer had a new tank, which usually we have no problems with new tanks. But, they put in a API designed gauge pole for their hand gauging, and they put a separate gauge pole in for the radar gauge, which is fine. Mm-hmm. But they didn't use the API standard. They they made a totally different gauge uh. pole. They and they tied it. This was a seventy foot tall tank, Oof. and it was tied to the side of the tank. So as the tank deformed, so did the pole. Oh no. I couldn't believe it. And we're like, can't we just switch poles? They're like, nope, that's for gauging. This is for radar. I'm like, all You're right. setting well. us up for failure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was pretty disappointed. Oh, and, wow. uh, and it's like, just, you know, follow API standards and we'll, we'll meet you there. If, it's, if you're putting in a gauge pole, we don't have any problems um, there. And uh, people dream up that we're going to have problems yeah. with gauge poles and we don't. Um, so the other, the other thing is if you are taking tanks down out of service because everybody goes through their API 653, which is their inspection. That's the greatest time. Even if you don't have the budget money for the gauging system at that point, at least make the provisions for an easy installation for the gauging. And that would be, if you don't have a good gauge pole, put in a good mm. proper API gauge pole. Uh, put in the proper temperature, uh, four inch uh, gauge pole, sort of mini gauge pole yeah. for the temperature. Uh, make those. That is the cheapest time to do it, and it's a nothing burger. It's a decimal point rounding error on a on a on an API six fifty three. Yeah. Yeah. It's just you have to get your tank program director to understand that that's something you would like to have and the benefits. Yes, and okay. then uh, you know, and it's not that big of a uh, well, not even that big of an increment to go and do a, go ahead and buy the gauge too <laughs> at the same time. But but at least get the provisions, and we're working on some documentation for that to give to. Tank inspector, tank and tank operations people to, mm, to help pa- them. Yeah, so here, here's your and it and what's good about it is I'm not putting you. I'm not. We're not painting you in an Emerson box that you have to buy our stuff. These are generic gauging. These are good practice. Why did just do it in general? Yeah, just do it in general. If you don't like us, you go buy our competitor. I don't want you to do that, but you know you have the provisions to do it. Yes. So okay, yeah. Yeah. and and so where do you see? The world of tank gauging going maybe in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Do you see uh, any technological advancements? Is it on the software side? Is it different technology? Is there I mean, anything you know you can share with yeah, us? Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot I can share. I mean, there, there's definitely – I can tell you that the main um, barrier to uh, installing automatic tank gauging on many of the existing tanks is installation cost. Mm. And the more we can do to lower that cost, mm. it includes wiring and everything and power. Okay. Um, we can uh, we can really move the ball, and uh, 
There are a lot of uh, a lot of tanks in North America, and I'd say uh, out of all of them, the X number, which took us a long time to figure out or guess, so I won't share it. <laughs> um, but uh, um, we we I I think that probably a third of them have some sort of gauging, and the rest don't. Really? Yes. Wow, that little. It's a big white space. Whoa. And um, so we're you know. Okay, and so you think probably a lot more wireless. Yeah, as, as especially as people adopt that and entrust right. that, they learn right, and and that's going to be, and it's still a going to take a lot more evangelizing, yeah, to, because it's a, it, but you know, there's there's a point where you have to just go, well, okay, here, take my red pill. This is, <laughs> it's going to work. It's working really well. I don't need to be afraid of it. And yes, embrace the new technology, yes. the new change. Yes, yeah. yeah, which is tough sometimes in worlds like this where they have standards that are in place for many years, and that's it's tough to change those standards, and it's a slow yep. moving. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, it's that's the challenges out there, and then also in North America, I mean, I think it's going to be a constant slog uh, to to try to improve. Have the have everyone take it upon themselves to improve their measurement mm. their expectations. Yeah, and uh, if we can, I mean, if somebody you know uh, decreed tomorrow that we needed to have legal custody transfer, I would kind of be happy, even though I don't like over regulation, <laughs> but that would be really good, um, you know. But uh, they're not going to do that. I mean, we're yeah. a business, we're a B two B kind of company. It's like if you well, if you don't care that I use a, a stick to measure the level, and then you're buying it on that, then let's do it. You know, yeah. that's what they do it. But the the you know the the um you know your I don't know what you call your uh, like Department of Commerce like Border Protection type sure. stuff. Yeah. I mean, those are the people that have a stake in in the yeah. taxation and stuff. So they're the ones I've heard at some of these API meetings talking about more frequent tank calibration uh. and. So they're trying to think, maybe there's, there's money on the table yep. here. And, you know, it's like, you know, we had a situation over in in the U.K. Um, our counterpart over there, the, the tank aging group in the U.K., started selling uh, radars to, very high-end radars to the to the uh, scotch industry, the, the distilling really? industry. And we actually made a completely new sort of package and did some modifications to Tank Master for alcohol tables. It was called VAT Master. V A T, yeah, and uh, you, it was great because that's uh, there's taxation on all that stuff, yep. and when they're just storing these things, they're they're constantly having to pay tax on all the stuff. That's why eighteen year scotch costs uh, quite a bit of money, right? Because they're paying that's, taxes on it plus inventory for all those years. So. I didn't realize that. Wow. Hey, her queen needs the money. Well, now it's the uh, now it's the king, the but king, the, the king, the king, the king. Well, now the king's shaking him down, but uh, yeah. But That's yeah, right. so it was worth it for them. I mean, it was. I, I took a trip over there. I was on my way to somewhere else, but I took a trip and we went and visited one of the distilleries, and it was just amazing to see a modern distillery with like eighty Rex radars at the time, wow. just looking at me like, "Wow, this is beautiful." Not, not <laughs> just for oil. Yeah, it was for you know the better. Yeah, stuff. yeah, better, <laughs> yeah. better, drinkable, some scotch, drinkable. Yeah, some good scotch. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. So it just shows you where the driving forces, yeah. you know, and who has interest, who are the stakeholders in your measurement, right? Yeah. Well, I only yeah. imagine it's it's going to be pushing for for more and more accuracy, right? As we're seeing a lot more yeah. you know, sustainability front, sure. right? Well, well, we don't want to waste stuff, right? We want to know what we have there. We don't want to overfill right. and spill and have right. environmental damage, right? So right, it, it, and and it's also you know operating. So if you look at API, like API has an overfill rate, uh, standard now uh, called API 2350, right? It's in its fifth edition. It used to be a recommended practice, and now it's a standard. And, you know, if you read the overfill prevention practice, it's not rocket science. Mm. It's really practical. Yeah. It's, it's written by operators. It's written by, with some regulator input and some manufacturer input. Um, you know, one of the, the first rule of operating a tank is knowing the available room in the tank before you move product into it. So... <laughs> How do you do that? Well, yeah. you, a, a gauging system is your 24-7 basic process control that is the most important layer. It's the, got the duty cycle way above everything else. Yep. I mean, it's always there, and it's going to give you, you know, your, you know, your available room is yes. calculated. If you look at a tank master screen, we have an AVRM number that's there all the time. It's so most important it's thing. like, you know, you don't put, you know, 20 gallons of fuel in a 10-gallon tank, right? It doesn't work. You got to convert to liters for us. Okay, okay right. yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> sorry. All good, all good. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's really interesting. Um, I, you know what? I want to thank you so much for your time, Rich. We had it was a, great. We had a really interesting conversation. I learned a lot about tank gauging. Um, and, you know, if I'm listening and, and I want to learn more, wh- where can I go learn more about tank gauging? Well, I mean, obviously, um, you know, lakeside process controls for us. You say process. I say process. <laughs> um, up, you know, do it, do it. You guys do a great job. And you, you cover 
the system stuff very well. You don't okay. have to worry about laying out a wire. I mean, I would trust you guys to lay out any wireless system, you know, yes. there is. Or marrying a tank master with a PK controller. Yeah. I, you guys can do that wonderfully. Um, I would I would say the first the first uh, line of defense is calling Lakeside. Great. I'm talk to, talking to you. And yes. You could probably get it out to the right. If you need to pull me in on something. Absolutely. Or, yeah, we have it. You have great people and your technical people, Nigel Barber, for one, I know yep. really well. Those are tank aging stuff in, in and out and backwards from the technical standpoint, you know, so. Great. Yeah. Well, yep. thank you so much, Rich. It's great. Yeah. Until right. next time, uh, take care. All right. Awesome. Thanks.